a little bit about the roadside animal detection system that's uh, just down the road here. And uh, start off, just this is a, a collaborative project involving the Fish and Wildlife Service, the uh, Florida Department of Transportation, uh, the National Park Service, and Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, the funding was provided by the Florida Department of Transportation, and um, we have we were supposed to start on this project actually this past spring. It was delayed because of uh, delays in getting the funding uh, approved, and so they delayed that to the next fiscal year. So that made it July, kind of August, we were supposed to start, but then we were delayed again because. This coincided with, as you can notice, there's some construction going on out on the highway. And at first they wanted us to go ahead and conduct the work then. And I said, no, nope, too disruptive Traff to traffic because we're evaluating not only animal movement, but also driver uh, behavior and vehicles. So, uh, so we're further delayed. So now we're looking at probably starting around the first of the year. So what you're going to get today really is what we're going to do, not what we've been doing or what we have done. So. Okay, so uh, first off, I've, I've been doing uh, studies on the impacts of roads and uh, mitigation for roads for wildlife uh, since about the mid-90s. Uh, it was part of my dissertation, my education. And it's been projects I've been working on, mostly in Florida, North Carolina, some work in Montana and California. So I've done a little bit around the country, um, but primarily in Florida is, is where most of my work is focused on. I'm going to start out just with a very brief intro on the effects of roads. And a lot of you probably know that in general, roads are bad for wildlife, for most wildlife. Some, some do take advantage of roads, um, but there's several different types of effects. I'm only going to focus on a couple of them, but uh, obviously road mortality is, is an obvious one. <coughs> but there's uh, there are also kind of filters or semi-permeable barriers for different species. So some species and some cohorts of species may avoid roads. Some may uh, be uh, selectively killed just because of their behavior. So it's kind of a semi-permeable permeable barrier. So it can cause isolation and, and fragmentation of habitat and, and wildlife populations. Uh, it can also act as, as a conduit for some uh, invasive species as well. Roads are notorious for allowing the spread of invasives, invasive plants, uh, insects, other types of species. Uh, also, spread of exotics into habitat areas from roads as well. And then probably the thing that's been researched the longest is uh, pollutants, erosion, and sedimentation issues in waterways from roads. And then last but not least, uh, it provides access to humans to get to remote areas that otherwise would remain wildland. So in, it also uh, causes the spread of development. But we're going to focus today mostly on just two aspects of this. One is the direct mortality and wildlife vehicle collisions uh, specifically. And then also how they act as barriers to movement and may change migratory, foraging, and mating behavior, among other things. And then last, I wanted to make sure that everybody's aware it's not just a wildlife issue. It's actually also a human issue as well. And that is one aspect that's important for getting funding and recognition for the problem, is by looking at the public safety aspect. Mm. Um, and so you can see that there was a study done and published in 2009 that was funded by the Federal Highways, and uh, basically showing what the cost to society is for an accident. And this focused mainly on ungulates. So looked at not only deer, but larger animals, which obviously cause more damage and more probability of human fatalities, such as elk and moose, something, things that you really don't want to get. But anyway, so you can see, so every time, on, on average, it costs society over $6,600 for each deer accident. And that includes all of these different aspects of the cause. 
the property damage, uh, human injuries and fatalities, all the other aspects of it, even including the value of the loss of the animal for hunting and other uses. Okay, so um, that kind of just gives you a very quick idea of the, of the impacts and costs of society. So what are the things that we're actually doing about it? Uh, primary goals of mitigation are, are two things, really. Reduce wildlife people collisions, and then also to reduce barrier effects and habitat fragmentation uh, that's caused by roads. And really, there's, there's three primary classes of mitigation. Uh, signs and warning devices, walls and fencing, and then crossing structures. Everybody's familiar <coughs> with the typical signs. Uh, there's all different types of signs. Just warning signs that animals are present here. There's, there's uh, speed uh, reduction signs, day and night type signs. In fact, those are uh, out here on US 41. So there's nighttime restrictions and speed uh, limits. There's also several different types of gadgets that have been introduced and tried, uh, including deer whistles on vehicles, uh, reflectors that have been placed on the roadsides that are supposed to, the car lights hit the angled reflectors and the light goes off into the right of way and it's supposed to scare deer and other animals away from the road. These gadgets have shown through different studies to be completely ineffective. So it's something you don't want to waste your money on. <laughs> uh, the other one is, this is kind of what I'm going to focus on in the talk here, uh, once I get over the preliminaries, is the animal detection systems. And that's what that other photograph is. That's one up in, uh, just outside of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, here's the barrier walls and, and uh, fences I talked about. Anybody that's gone 29 has, has gone through the prison uh, look, so these big tall fences to try to keep panthers and bears and large animals like that from getting in the road and, and involved in collision. So there's all such types of aesthetic problems with this. Also, tremendous habitat fragmentation element. It really restricts and alters movement patterns of the animals. Uh, there's other types of fences like the one on the, the lower uh, left hand side there, which is designed mainly for herps and smaller critters to keep them off the roads. And then sometimes we have walls and systems that have some type of permeability measure uh, built into it, like these culverts. That's the Paints Prairie just south of Gainesville. And then this is kind of granddaddy and the most expensive of the measures, and that's these large crossing structures. Uh, the upper photo is one of the aerial shots of one of the I-75 crossings. Uh, the one in the lower left is the same as the ones on State Road 29, but this happens to be on State Road 46 up by Wakaiba River. Uh, it was built there for uh, a really bad hotspot for black bears. And then the, uh, the lower uh, right is a three and a half million dollar overpass that was built at Banff National Park in Canada. Okay, so now, Kind of looking at how, how effective are all these different methods that I've just shown you. And basically they focus on two different things. One is modifying the behavior of the animals, which is over on the left side of the graph. And then the right side is modifying the behavior of the drivers and the people. So there's two different ways to try to tackle the problem. Um, on the left hand side, Things like fencing, wildlife crossings, and hazing issues that have been tried with deer to keep them away from the roadways, relatively ineffective. So you can see uh, from the, uh, the dark bars are the success, relative success, and the gray is how much it's been used in different states. So just looking at the dark bars, you can see with wildlife fencing and the overpasses, obviously wildlife fencing can be very uh, successful in preventing collisions, but it's also highly fragmenting to the habitat. So that's a huge negative, even though it's very positive to reducing wildlife beetle collisions. The overpasses, underpasses one, 
That's also very successful, but also very costly. Uh, and then the bars get much lower. So as you get to the, the things that cost the least amount of money, the much less effective they actually are. What is, what is hazing? Hazing, uh, using methods to, to scare the animals away from the roadway. Okay, and then there was a cost study that was done uh, looking at uh, a kind of a cost-benefit analysis that was done on all these different types of methods, reducing uh, vehicle speed, warning signs, detection systems, fencing, crossings, but just focus pretty much on the second uh, number column there, which is the percent wildlife vehicle collision reduction. And I highlighted the ones that actually are fairly successful. So over 80%, and it's the animal detection systems, the fencing, and then fencing in combination with different types of crossings or animal detection systems. So those are all over 80%. Everything else is 40% or lower. So you may not spend very much money on it, but it's not really doing you a whole lot of good. Because you're still having a lot of collisions and more cost to society. Okay, so now I'm going to really hone in on the animal protection systems. And uh, there's several positive and negatives to this, and there's different types of systems, too. So, uh, the cost, first of all, the cost. Um, and that's actually, I guess, my third one in there, but anyway, I'll talk about that first. It has a lower initial cost. The construction cost is much lower than building a large crossing structure. So if your target is a Florida panda or a black bear, you're going to have to build a, a fairly substantial structure. So that initial construction cost is going to be fairly high. This is, can be much lower on the order of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, where a good sized crossing is going to cost you at least 500,000 if you're talking about a four lane highway or even a, a really good structure on a two lane, you're talking about a million dollars to a million and a half dollars to build it. And the fencing includes uh, re <coughs> traffic. So there's a lot of aspects associated with it. So it's so an expensive endeavor to do a wall crossing. So that's, that's an initial positive. So initially, it's a lot cheaper. There's no fencing allowed, or, uh, associated with it, which allows really free flow movement of animals across the roadway. So you don't have any altering of movement patterns. So that's generally a positive as well. And then theoretically, even though this has never been used in really long distances, there's no limit on the length of the system because it's all integrated. So you can make it miles long if you want, whereas a crossing, that's going to be just located in one single point along the road. And then the benefits that I alluded to a little bit earlier, if you have five deer collisions or more, the benefits exceed the cost prevented for, per mile. So uh, the cost to build or install one of these systems has a net benefit if you, if you had previously had five or more deer collisions that you're now preventing. Okay, that's the positive. There's also the negatives too. Uh, it only targets larger animals. So anything small, any herbs, any invertebrates, any small mammals generally are not um, uh, benefited at all by these types of systems because the way the sensor systems work, they only uh, identify larger animals. <coughs> the other uh, negative to it is maintenance. Uh, maintenance turns out to be a, a large cost associated with these. Control of vegetation because you have to maintain a clear pathway for the sensors to work. Also, technology, it's, it's a very technological thing. Unlike a bridge, it's static. Once you build it, it's just there and it works. But this can have all kinds of bugs and things associated with it. It requires electricity and power. That's a, that's a negative. And the other thing is kind of in the function itself. Depending on how uh, well it's working, how its performance is, it can produce false negatives and positives. And what I mean by that, a false negative is saying that there's no animal there in the road when in fact there really is. That's a really bad one. 
<laughs> is if it's something like an endangered forward panther, that means it's still going to get killed. It's going to be notified when it's in the road. A false positive is when it's telling you something's in the road and it's not there. And that can have the effect of causing driver apathy. So meaning that if the system is just popping off and going off all the time, people are driving through there and they're noticing that this thing doesn't do anything at all. So they're just going to start tuning it out and not pay attention. And in one of those times, it's going to have an animal in and it's going to get hit. So those are two aspects to the system and its performance that's very critical and very important. Now there's um, really three things I want to point out about the types of systems that are out there. It really uses this very similar technology to your, your uh, game and trail cameras. It's a sensor system. That's really all it is. And there's different types of sensors. There's the old type of, uh, I don't know if anybody ever used trail masters. That's a break the beam system where it has a transmitter and a receiver. And so it has a, a, an infrared beam that connects those. And anything that goes through there and breaks that is going to set off the warning. The other is an area cover system, which uh, can be conical shaped or a wedge shaped. And so anything that comes into that area is going to be detected. And then that would set the system off. And then the, another thing I wanted to mention is that there's uh, what I call them as a dummy system and an intelligence system. So these things can become very high-tech and expensive. A dummy system is like the trail master I was just telling you about, and anybody that's used them knows. Well, if anything can go in front of that. It's not going to know what it is. If it's just an object, it doesn't even have to be alive. It can be vegetation blowing. That'll set it off. The, the system just doesn't know. There's actually very intelligent systems that do signatures of animals, and, and it, you can program it to only work for specific animals. So you can get very high tech with these. The other very important aspect is the warning signs. And there's different, several different types out there to get driver's attention. They can be lighted, they can be animated, they can even have message boards. So to come on and just say, Florida Panther in the road, slow down, or something like that. So here's an example of the real high-tech, very expensive one I was just talking about. This one was installed in, in Arizona on State Road 260, where there was a real hot spot of elk crossing the road and a lot of collisions and fatalities to people, not only to animals. So they put in this system, and in the upper left, you can see the, the silhouettes at the top of that. Uh, this thing uh, takes video of the um, roadside, and it's programmed in for silhouettes of particular animals. So if the target animal is one of those silhouettes coming through there, then it's gonna set off the warning system. If it's not, then it won't go off. Say, for instance, like a raccoon or something like that when they're through there, that wouldn't set off the system. And that actually helps, because if you're really focusing on trying to prevent collisions with large animals that cause public safety problems, you don't want it going off all the time for every small animal that goes through there. Because as I was mentioning before, the driver apathy aspect. So the less it goes off, the more they're going to kind of pay attention to it and recognize its importance. Okay, so this, this particular system, <coughs> US 41, so we're just, the system goes from Turner River Road West, basically 1.3 miles. It uh, has some notification signs telling the driver that they're entering the zone approximately a half mile before you get to it. And then there's two other aspects. The distance between the warning signs is 200 feet through the zone. So, and they're all connected together. And so when one, if the sensors trip, all of those signs are going to go off, no matter where within the system it's tripped. Now, the sensors are 500 feet. That's basically just a distance of how effective they are as far as the uh, detection area. And then I, I threw up some just kind of uh, basic statistics of the area. Traffic volume really is comparatively very low out here. In fact, I was commenting just earlier 
When I was out here yesterday, I was driving through this area, and two people in front of me stopped and did a three-point turn right in the road. This is tra no traffic. But because of the low traffic, that also means typically to drive over the speed limit, too. So that's a big issue, is driving too fast, even though there's nighttime speed limits. Uh, another kind of a problem with this site is the narrow clear zone. So people don't, when they're driving down the road, they don't have a lot of forewarning when an animal's entering the road. It comes out of the mangroves and then bang, it's right in the road. So the reaction time is much less than if you had a nice wide clear zone. But obviously you're limited here because of the canal and, and the landscape. Uh, there's several side roads and driveways within the system too. And those can create problems. Okay. Um, oh, actually, what I, another thing I forgot to mention is um, there's been seven panthers killed uh, since '84, between '84 and 2010. But five of those occurred since 2004. So the last half of the past decade, all of a sudden, one was getting killed every year there. So this all of a sudden really became a significant hotspot. It had been identified in models previous to that as an important wildlife movement location. And then also telemetry data that showed that panthers were crossing here a lot. So it was already targeted as an important hotspot location that some sort of mitigation really needed to be done. Um, the system, this is kind of some photographs of what it looks like. Huh? The upper left is what one of the sensors looks like. And then the warning signs, and it's kind of, where's that pointer go? It's hard to see on this slide, but there's little LED lights that go all the way around this. And if you've driven down there, and for any reason it's been off, you would have seen them flashing. They're actually very bright, you can see them in the daytime. Um, the whole system is solar powered. Uh, so it's not dependent on, uh, you know, if there's a power outage or anything like that. That is not an issue. Um, I mentioned this before, it's an integrated system. So all of these sensors for the whole 1.3 miles is daisy chain, meaning they're all linked. And so it uh, also is connected to a central computer system through wireless. And so it does, the reason for that is twofold. One is it logs, no matter which one of those 500 foot segments that an animal crosses through, it's going to log that, that the system was broken there. So it records that uh, something moves through the system. It'll log the, the date and the time. It can't tell you what it is. This is a dummy system, so it doesn't know. But it's also important for maintenance, too. If for some reason one of the sensors gets misaligned or there's a malfunction in it, it will notify them at the central computer, which is at, I think, the DOT maintenance office in Naples, I believe is where it's located. Uh, it will notify them that, hey, such and such sensor has gone down. So they, need, they know they need to go out there and repair it. OK, so now this is kind of the final thing <coughs> of my talk here. The objectives of our study are really one primarily to uh, evaluate the performance of the system. So that means we have to do two things. One is determine the reliability of RADS in detecting the target species itself. And the target species is primarily the Florida panther. That's why it was installed. But it's also important to identify whether it's working well for deer, for wild hog, also for, uh, what's the other one I'm missing? Bears. Yeah, panther. Okay, bears. bears. So all of those large animals that you know, can cause problems with collisions or are, are listed or protected. So we want to make sure that it's working properly for them. So we're going to do basically five things to try to address this objective. And one downside of this project, and I've tried to get this across to DOT on many studies, is they really need to fund us to collect pre um, construction data <laughs> so we can really do a true evaluation of how well the system is working. If you don't have information on what the animals are doing beforehand, it's hard to tell how well it's working just collecting post-construction data, but yet again, this is one of those cases. So we've got to try to do the best we can with 
time we have. So we're going to collect and compare on-site field data uh, from the data loggers with infrared camera traps that we're going to set up out there. So we're going to actually compare that information. So if it breaks the beam in one particular spot, we want to have a camera there to record what that is that broke the beam. And uh, we'll be working with Deb Jansen for the most part in identifying the locations most likely the panthers are moving through there through her work and, and also through the telemetry data that's been collected for the panther. Uh, we're going to do some, aside from that, we're going to also do some on site reliability tests looking at surrogate animals. One of the problems is we can't really control what the panthers are doing in the game. Are they running through? Are they walking through? We want to know how well the system works during these different types of mo movement. So we can use surrogate animals like a you know, some dog or something that's similar size and shape to a panther and see how the system performs in a controlled situation like that. Running the animal through or walking it through, changing its behavior and see what it does. We're also going to, because we don't have the uh, pre-construction data, we're going to analyze what's available. Telemetry data, roadkill data, any kind of species inventories for the area to try to get a handle on that. And then, um, obviously, we'll be collecting and analyzing post-installation roadkill data as well. And then uh, the last thing down here is we're also, in addition to the work we're doing on 41, we have a control site that we're going to set up in the Florida Panther <coughs> National Wildlife Refuge with one of these sensor systems and a video camera. And we're going to set up in a location where there's a good bit of panther traffic. So we get more data to uh, you know, really evaluate how well it works. Because we don't think we'll get enough hits out here on 41. And then the last objective is evaluating the effectiveness of the warning signage. That's the other big aspect of this. OK, it doesn't detect the animals. But second, is it being effective in warning the drivers? And are they actually slowing down? So we're going to do a speed study. We're going to try to do some questionnaires of the public and see their perception and reaction to it. And then last, we're going to actually do a driver simulation study. And so we're going to have subjects go through the driver simulator, have them exposed to animals or not animals, different types of warning signs, and see uh, what their uh, response time is and what their behavior is, their alertness. They see an animal, are they, you know, lifting their head up, are they slowing down? So we're going to evaluate that as well. So we're doing all sorts of different things to try to address these different issues. And that's all we have right now. So hopefully next time we come back, I'll actually be able to give you some data on what's going on with it. Thanks a lot.
transmission canal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's another problem. How do you decide how long the signals go off once the animal is crossed? Is it based on what species you're focusing on? Or? Uh, that was a decision made in my absence, so I cannot uh, <laughs> continue to answer it as to why they chose the time interval, but actually it goes off for 10 minutes after it's been set off. That's another thing that I'm actually going to evaluate. Is that an optimal length of time for that to be going on? It's a very slow panther. That's what I was going to say. The is an animal crossing, and I think that's too long. So it, it has to be a combination of the speed of the animal crossing the road and the time it takes for someone to slow down. So how much advanced warning they need. I don't know exactly how they came up with 10 minutes. Uh, I, I think it's not probably been done scientifically. <laughs> yes. It might not just be crossing the road with the canal on one side. They might be walking along the ways. That's entirely possible. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, this, this project is wrought with pitfalls. There's no doubt about it. And so that part is really going to be fun. To, to, yeah. Isn't there a lawsuit from a motorist who hit a hit an animal? I mean, said you know his lawyers claim and the system failed to warn. Uh, there is a lawsuit. I don't know that much about the specifics of it. That's the problem. I've heard one account. I've heard it, the accident occurred outside the rad zone, but other people have said that it occurred in. And I don't. I actually don't know exactly where it occurred. That seems like something that should be very easy to nail down. Because if there was an accident report, I'm assuming it were, there was. They have to know exactly where that accident was. So, but I don't have the answer to that, unfortunately. I'd like to find that out if anybody yeah, knows. Yeah, it was just in the paper. I just yeah. So yeah, there's a pending lawsuit. It's not going to affect this research project, but I don't know what will happen. Thanks again.